Great, wonderful. Thank you, Joshua. And welcome everybody to this short presentation. It's wonderful to meet you, even though I cannot see you in person. It's great the fact that you are here and that you are interested in, in this topic and want to find out more about gender equality in international affairs. So first of all, on your screen, I have just given you an overview of the Gender Equality Initiative in International Affairs. We call it GIA for short, so that's the abbreviation in the center of the screen. And essentially, our role here um, in the Gender Equality Initiative is to really prepare global gender equality policymakers, expert practitioners, program designers, and leaders and change agents. So we take gender equality in international affairs very seriously. And I'm going to explain more to you in detail in a moment about why we do this and really what the correlations are between gender equality and international affairs. I'm also going to talk through each of these circles that you can see in the presentation to give you a flavor for the types of students who come into this program, what it is they're interested in doing and where they want to work, what it is they want to research, as well as the sorts of seminars, workshops, and events that we organize for our students and our wider community, our expert gender practitioner faculty, academics, and researchers and of course our curriculum. So first of all, why gender equality in international affairs? Because we know that countries that have greater levels of gender equality are more stable, prosperous, and secure. Put simply, where men and women and all genders are more equally equal in a society, that society tends to be less war prone. So when we include all genders in institutional decision making, it makes those institutions more effective and it makes the outcomes uh, more impactful for the broader society. For example, when women are included in peace negotiations, they are 64% less likely to fail and they are 35% more likely to last for 15 years. So this is a key outcome when the average peace agreement only lasts for five years. And yet, over the past 20 years, when we look at the statistics, women made up only 13% of all negotiators to peace agreements. They only made up 3% of mediators and 4% of signatories. And only two women have ever been chief negotiators. So we have a lot of work to do in relation to creating gender equality globally and specifically in the area of international affairs. So just wanted to give you this quick snapshot of statistics. So this gives you an overview of the global statistics on gender inequality. It is estimated that there are over 120 million women missing from the world due to sex-selective abortions. One in three women experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. And this is a statistic by the World Health Organization. Women and girls are 71% of the people trafficked and three quarters of those women and girls are being trafficked for sexual exploitation. In 2015, 23% of women undergraduate students on college campuses in the US reported being sexually assaulted. And these statistics still stand today. In North Africa and the Middle East, 40 to 60% of women have reported being, being harassed in the streets. And globally, we know we have a massive underrepresentation of women politicians at only 24% of all politicians globally are women. So we have a massive overrepresentation of male politicians, obviously, but also 82% of these women politicians have reported humiliating and sexist threats. One in 10 women in the EU have reported cyber harassment, and 3 million girls are at risk of FGM in the year, in it globally each year. Over 200 million women have already um, undergone FGM. 
one in five girls globally um, are in child marriages, either forced or otherwise. And more, men are more than twice as likely to commit suicide. Men are also, as you know, the majority of soldiers worldwide and also the majority of peacekeepers at 96%. Only 4% of all peacekeepers are women. And there, have been, uh, there has been a huge push by the UN to increase the numbers of women globally. But there's a number of stumbling blocks. And again, you can ask me questions about that at the end of the presentation if you're interested. 40% of armed forces use children. And currently, it's estimated that there's about 300,000 child soldiers worldwide. Most of them are boys, but there are also many girls child soldiers in the world. So in many countries in the world, 72, same-sex relationships are still illegal. And in eight of those countries, they are punishable by death. And women constitute only 5% of signatures to peace processes. Yes, as I've already said, they make a huge impact when they are present in those peace processes in terms of the sustainability of the processes because of the diversity of experiences and the inclusivity of the different experiences that women and other members of society have, have had during the conflict that are brought to the peace table. Okay, so I'm now going to tell you a little bit about the Gender Equality Initiative and our student body. So currently this year, we have 43 students um, with gender concentration. And these are spread across three different programs at the moment. So 23 of those students are from International Development Studies, 17 from Masters in International Affairs, and three from the Masters in Public Policy and Practice. We have 11 capstones focused on global gender policy. And we have a new director coming in, Christina Wilford. You can Google her. Um, and find out about her extensive experience, but she's going to be leading those capstones in, in the fall. So what are the topics of the capstones? Well, they are varied, but this year, for example, I can share with you that one of the capstones is about engaging men and masculinity in the healing of sexual and gender-based violence affected communities in Northern Ireland. And another one, is working with women in Afghanistan on the peace process and their exclusion from the peace process. So conducting research on that particular topic. In terms of student success, our students go on to work in a number of different uh, fields, but with an expertise on gender, gender equality. So for example, Ruth um, is currently working as a monitoring and evaluation advisor for care in Ethiopia. Louisa is working on the gender portfolio for Central America at USAID. Elizabeth is working at UN Women as their policy and resource mobilization analyst. And Marina has been an, a recent intern also at UN Women. So again, you, can, you might be interested in asking me more questions about that types of jobs and, and types of institutions, but that's just a flavor of some of the career paths our students are following after their course here. So in terms of the curriculum, we have the largest number of gender courses in the DC area of all the universities in DC. So here is an overview of our courses for this year. You can see in the spring, I've taught two courses, Global Gender Policy, Gender, War, and Peace. And again, I don't have time to go into the details of all these courses, but I can certainly answer questions about them. Um, we also have, um, besides the three credit courses, we also have a number of one credit skills courses. So if you look down to the bottom of the spring section, you can see three courses at the end there, Feminist Research Methods in Post-Conflict Settings gender advisor roles and skills, and gender responsive budgeting, they're all one credit professional skills courses. And then we also have a, a skills course focused on monitoring and eva evaluation. 
if you look down to the bottom of the fall 2020 section, you can see there's a course there being taught by Dr. Andrea Bertone, who is the um, Director of Gender Policy and Strategy at FHI 360, an international development agency. So she'll be teaching that course on gender M&E in fall 2020. So you can also see if I move down, so these are the MA courses. And I'm really proud to announce that we have this new course. You can see Masculinities in International Affairs being taught by Lakshman Spellbase and Scott Wiener. And this course will critically examine the diverse experiences, roles, relationships, and responsibilities of men and boys in international affairs. And it will look across different contexts from pre-conflict to conflict to militarized masculinities, violent masculinities, diplomatic masculinities, and peaceful masculinities. So we're really excited about this new course, which is coming online for 2020. In fact, we're opening it up to both undergrads and grads, because we think this is a very important course to really round out the knowledge and the research and the expertise of our community and um, with a focus on gender equality. So again, like I said, you can ask me more about those courses later. I'm just going to show you quickly now the undergraduate courses. So this semester, we have Farana Kazi, who's been teaching gender conflict and security. Kayla Brushu teaching human trafficking, and Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula teaching women and leadership in Africa. And in the fall, we have um, Women in Global Politics, which is one of the courses that I teach, Women and Terrorism, another course, again, Gender Conflict and Security, and another human trafficking course. Then we have Women's Rights and Gender Equality, Masculinities and International Affairs, and Migration, Gender, and International Development. And I meant to mention earlier, we also have another new graduate course coming online um, in the fall, and that is Gender and Security. Um, I literally just found out about it uh, today, and it's going to be taught by our very esteemed professor, Dr. Michael Brown, and it's a graduate level course. Okay. I've already mentioned the other courses here. You can just get a snapshot. For example, gender responsive budgeting. What is that? We're developing templates, types of projects, monitoring adherence um, across different issues such as health, education, and agri agriculture. Monitor gender monitoring and evaluation analyzes indicators of bilateral donors and applies gender scales, collects data to improve outcomes. And then the feminist research methods in post-conflict settings looks at the ethics and practice of feminist research in conflict-effective contexts, intersectionality, and participatory research methods. Here are three of our research scholars, and I won't go into each of their work in detail, but just to say that Gwen Young has brought into the Elliott School a new Global Women's Leadership Index. And this looks at the pathways um, to power and positions for women across the globe in um, public service leadership roles. That particular index is going to be launched later this year. We also have a GIA G advisory group. I won't go into all the details of all the different advisors we have there, but I think it's interesting for you to know that some of them are our alums. For example, Sonola Daly is an alum, and she is the Global Women's Empowerment Lead at the International Finance Corporation. We also have at the bottom, Jenna Ben Yehuda, who is the President and CEO of the Truman Center. She's also an alum, and she also leads the Leadership Council for Women in National Security. Um, and just to also point out here, a couple of people who are in the top 20 most influential people globally on gender equality. First of all, Gary Barker, who's the president and CEO of Promundo. It's an organization that runs programs and conducts research on engaging men and boys to end violence against women and girls. Also, Mary Alsberg, who's the executive director of the Global Women's Institute here at the George Washington University. 
and Lyra Thompson, who's also one of our faculty. She teaches a course on advocating women's rights, and she is the Director of Policy and, and Advocacy at ICRW. So that advisory group is involved in directing the, the work of the GIA and the Global Gender Policy Program, its, uh, its programs, its events, its conferences, etc. So here's a feel for some of the conferences and events that we have been recently working on. We had a, a large one-day event to celebrate International Women's Day, and that included a number, two different panels, um, one on women in national and international security, and one as women as change agents in peace and security. We also had a photo exhibition, Raise Your Voice for Gender Equality, and that was created by uh, GW students and curated by them. And then also we had a conversation with the International Women of Current Awardees um, by they, essentially the US State Department nominates 10 women every year for outstanding courage as human rights defenders across the globe. And I had the privilege of moderating a conversation with three of those women. We also had an event in February on how women saved Rwanda, talking to a number of women um, from Rwanda and the work that they have been doing on justice, human rights, and gender equality issues. And then last year, we had an event with our Shapiro professor, Admiral Michelle Howard, on the Women, Peace, and Security National Action Plan here in the US, and the future of the implementation plan to deliver U.S. national security um, on women, peace, and security. And we also had the launch of a photo exhibition, Women in War, Evolving the Narratives of Women's Contributions to Peace and Security in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I think we're coming to the end. I'm just going to quickly show you some photographs here. So this was our International Women's Day event. This is um, some photographs of our students and their messages of solidarity to women across the world in violent um, and conflict settings. Um, here we have the Women of Courage awardees, 10 women for this year at the event at the Elias. These are the women involved in the panel on how women saved Rwanda. This is a photograph of Admiral Michelle Howard discussing um, the US's National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security. And this is the photo exhibition, some of the photos you can see there from um, the, women, um, the Women in War exhibition about women in Bosnia-Herzegovina and their involvement in um, post-conflict reconstruction. I've already mentioned um, some of our faculty. This is a snapshot again. And just to say, you can, you can look at this Prezi in your own time um, on our website. So if you go into GIA at the Elliott School, you'll be able to access this Prezi and find out more information about each of our faculty. And they're all gender expert instructors. And they work at institutions like USAID, State Department, International Development Agencies. And this is just a little bit about me. Again, you can look at that online in your own time. And the GEO Program Assistant, Katie Chambers, and also our Research Assistant, Erin Cherasnowski. And she's working very closely with Gwen Young on the Global Women's Leadership Index. So I'm just going to go right back to the very beginning and now invite you to ask me any questions that you may have about the work that we're doing in GIA, or about our program, our curriculum, or our events, anything at all that you're interested in finding out more about that might be useful for you in terms of your own decision making about whether you're interested in essentially um, participating in a course on gender equality and international affairs, or um, having a gender specialization, a gender capstone, or any other way interested in this particular topic. So I can't see any questions at the moment. Oh, hold on. Oh, here, Celia has a question. What are some 
opportunities available through GF4 internships. We do have, we do have um, opportunities within the initiative itself, Celia. So we do regularly also apply for funding um, for students to support various different research projects that we're running within the program. And we also, through our gender advisory group and our wider community, have um, a lot of connections with internships in those organizations. Um, and they tend to reach out to us first when those positions become available. And so then we can, what we also do, which I didn't mention, is we have a news bulletin that we send out every uh, two weeks, bi-weekly, uh, to our community so that um, we can highlight any of those opportunities that come available um, in the preceding week. I just can't see, uh, Joshua, I think you just sent me a message and it disappeared, so I think I might. To sign up for the newsletter, go on to our website and there's a sign up page there. Um, Hey, Dr. Grimm, you also have questions on, is it possible to complete the Global Tender Policy Certificate in conjunction with another graduate program, such as SPS? And if so, is the certificate program something that they would need to apply to separately? So the answer is yes and yes. So you can do it alongside um, SPS, um, and also, and you would need to apply for it separately. So if you do do it alongside, so it's 15 credit certification. So if you do it alongside your um, MA, essentially six, we, we drop off six credits. So essentially we take away six credits. And so then you have the remaining nine credits to choose from my global gender policy course, which is the core course for the program, and then you can look down our other courses and choose from those courses. So you could either do three one-credit professional skills courses and, and one other three-credit course, or two other three-credit courses. What were some of the other questions, Josh? I don't think I can see them on my screen. Yeah, the next question is, is have any previous students incorporated queer theory and or post-structuralist approach to international affairs? So um, probably they have, but I can't honestly tell you about all the students' research that existed before I arrived. I'm here the past two and a half years. Um, I'm not aware of somebody using that particular theoretical framework in a capstone at the moment. But that being said, I don't have access to all the capstone proposals at the moment either because they're in process. Um, and I haven't yet had an opportunity under the current circumstances to hear all the all the um, kind of interim pieces of research. So normally what happens is around about now, I get invited in to hear the preliminary research um, from our capstone students and they share with me the theoretical framework and the outputs from the research thus far and I essentially critique it and then they come back with their final presentation at the end of the semester. It hasn't actually happened yet this semester, so that's why I'm saying I don't know at the moment um, in relation to that particular question. It's definitely something I will find out about and know more about soon. You're very welcome to email me as well after the presentation to follow up, and I will be very happy to respond to individual queries. What were some of the other questions, Josh? So another student uh, said that they attended a GW exhibition with a research who used photo voice as part of her research. And for the exhibition, would there be opportunities to use photo voice in their research as well? And are there opportunities for taking other skills courses, such as video with our classes at the Elliott School? Yeah, so um, that particular researcher, Jessica Smith, um, she is teaching that course again in the summer. She will probably be teaching it online. Um, and, and there would be opportunity for you to use photo voice with your own research, but it would have to, it would have to conform to the, um, the type of research you're doing, obviously. So that would all have to be factored in in relation to the type of research 
you're going to be doing, um, depending on the course and your area of focus. Um, but certainly you could use that model in terms of engaging with primary research participants and photography and from that building out a narrative that informs your research findings. And then I see that there was also a question around um, books that you could read in advance. Um, so there's Women in War by Cynthia Cohn, which is one of the core books that I use for my Gender, War and Peace course, and I would highly recommend that. And there's a new book that's just come out literally um, in March this year, and it's called, called The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and National Security Worldwide, and that's by Valerie Hudson, Bowen and Nielsen, and I would highly recommend that book also. But again, I can um, post a listing of different books that we are using in our curriculum that I can, I can post that online and uh, you can refer to that. And again, please do feel free to email me for more detailed information. And Dr. Graham, would you mind putting your email into the chat window for students to be able oh, to email? Of course, yes. Okay, here we go. Oh, okay. I can see now why I didn't see the chat earlier. Okay. So this is my email, Shirley Graham at gwu.edu. So hopefully you can all see that now. So please feel free. Okay. And then you can also access the bulletin online as well. Yeah, cool. some of the questions there. Okay, yeah. I, think, I think I've answered most of them. Yes, and uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in today to provide your information of GIA and how students can be involved. Um, so if students have uh, any other questions pertaining to GIA, uh, feel free to email Dr. Graham. Uh, she just posted her uh, email address in the chat window. You can also feel free to email us at es I A G R A D at G W U dot E D U. And if you have any questions, we can also connect you with Dr. Graham as well. But once again, thank you so much, Dr. Graham, for uh, providing this informational session today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Best of luck. Take care.